NLC TUC signed a 15 point agreement with the federal government. I am Bola Hoba, and this is Plus Politics. The organized labor unions have signed a 15-point memorandum of understanding with the federal government. This agreement was signed by the representatives of the Nigeria Labor Congress, NLC, the Trade Union Congress, TUC, and the federal government as a last-minute effort to avert the planned nationwide strike yesterday. Some of the agreements reached are the federal government grants a wage award of 35,000 Naira only to all federal government workers beginning from the month of September pending when a new national minimum wage is expected to have been signed into law. The federal government commits to pay 25,000 per month for three months starting from October 2023 to 15 million households, including vulnerable pensioners. The federal government also suspends collection of value-added tax, VAT, on diesel for six months beginning from October 2023. These and 12 other agreements were reached. However, the organized private sector, OPS, which is a relatively higher employer of labor than the federal government, was left out of the negotiations and the final agreement that will inevitably lighten it with cost implications. Joining me to discuss this is, to start with, Comrade Peter Essele, former president Trade Union Congress, TUC, and Pengerson. It's a pleasure having you on, Comrade. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Comrade, how can one start by, by not asking you why would labor so distrust government these days that labor, after reaching an agreement with the federal government, made it mandatory that the agreement must be notarized, that it must be taken to a court of competent jurisdiction and be registered in the books of the court. That distrust is seemingly profound. I would want to respond to that. Uh, well, you know, there's a, there's a parable in my place that when, when a child is beaten by the snake, uh, he, 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 he or she gets scared of uh, the lizard. So whether to give this current administration the benefit of a doubt, because why I use that uh, analogy is because this current administration, they are just about, uh, about four months old. So we've not gotten to the point whereby they have uh, flip flop on any agreement yet. But they both uh, organized labor decided to be on the safe side because so many things uh, have happened in the past that government have not uh, uh, heeded. So, this is the way they think they can get out of it, and they just have to do it. So whichever means that you know will work for you, you just have to do it. And it speaks volume of the lack of trust, as you have alluded to. And it's, 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 it's painful. And I think government can take a cue from that so that uh, such a thing doesn't happen. And they also tell you now that if government does not comply with that agreement, government will, on one hand, be, be, be in contempt of our legal system, and on the other hand, Labour will have every right to shut down the country in whatever way they want it. I am sitting there thinking, is it the history of the relationship of Labour with the federal government? Is it that we just somewhat, at this juncture, have a very, a very... I, I really want to be very polite in my use of language, but a, a seemingly more 
aggressive, more abrasive uh, labor leader number one because uh, Ajero comes with a, with a form of history in the labor movement. At some point, he was even an outcast in the mainstream labor movement because uh, he had always portrayed himself to be, uh, to be so tough and so hard. So is it because we are in the Ajero era now that this kind of uh, push of distrust and formalization of agreement at the at the court is coming to play. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I think what is playing out is is on both sides. It's on both sides side actually. And uh, what I think is playing out here is if I I'll give an example of myself. When I was Pengasin president, I was dealing with branches and majority of our branches are in the uh, Organized private sector. They are majorly OPS, OP, OPS members. Association with an IOC, it will be it will go on for six months. But once we sign an agreement, it sticks. And not until when I became president of TUC, whereby I have to start negotiating with uh, uh, federal government, state government, that I started seeing how agreements are not respected. We can, the organized private sector, we can have a disagreement, we can go on for a year, but once an agreement is reached, it's sacrosanct. Uh, okay. They won't break uh, it. Uh, uh, comrade, but when my, it comes to the federal government, my distinguished, a government. My, my distinguished comrade, uh, please let me introduce your, your colleague on this. Uh, yeah, uh, hello, Dr. Muda. Dr. Muda Yusuf is the director uh, CEO Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise was once the uh, Director General of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and in view of the kind of scenario that has just played out with the agreement that Labour labor reached with the federal government, one wonders, Labour has reached this agreement with the federal government but the private sector, the organized private sector is relatively a higher employer than the federal government itself, and they were left out of the negotiations and the, and the agreement. Dr. Yusuf, if I may just use this to usher you in, what would be your take of an agreement where the organized private sector's head was shaved, uh, was shaved in his absence? Well, I would be surprised if they private sector was uh, not involved in this because I know that NECA has consistently been part of the discussions, you know, around the strikes and the negotiation of wages. Uh, I'm not privy to the last meeting, whether NECA was there or not. But having said that, let me say that the private sector is already ahead okay. of many of these uh, negotiations and outcomes that was just recently released. You mean the organized now, private sector? You mean the organized yes, private yes, sector? The, yes, the organized private sector, particularly the large enterprises, the large corporates, and so on. I'm not talking now about the SMEs. Because when we talk about private sector, it's not just the organized private sector, it's not just the big companies. Uh, who populate the OPS. I'm also talking about the SMEs. So the OPS components of the organized private sector have taken a whole lot of steps ahead of what is being even agreed to now. You know, many of them have increased their transport allowances for their workers. Many of them are, have introduced a lot of remote working options. Many of them have provided buses for their staff. And many of them have reviewed the salaries of their workers as well, significantly, even much more than issues of just this way that world or 25% or, or so. In some cases, transport allowances have increased by more than 100%. So the private sector had done quite a lot already. But that is not to diminish the importance of inclusiveness or inclusion in this negotiation process. And I believe that NECA, that normally engages on behalf of the private sector have been 
substantially part of the negotiations uh, with labor. But I cannot say specifically uh, with respect to this latest uh, with agreement res that was reached. With, with respect to this uh, latest agreement, NECA's DG was quite vehement when he was making the point I think yesterday on the platform that they were not literally they were not literally part of it. However, they are going to inevitably bear. But that's not the issue now, Doctor Yusuf. You have hemmed your reputation as a respected um, macroeconomist. And looking at the 15-point agreement, what would be your summary of uh, the likely consequential effect? on the economy? Well, uh, the effects will be will be uh, fairly fairly okay. But let me put it this way. Certainly, there has been a lot of challenges as a result of the reforms that has taken place. And the position of labor, one can also understand. Not just for the workers, but the average, but for the average Nigerian, because uh, the hardship has been quite enormous, yeah. and the government has also not responded as fast as uh, we had also expected. So there is a point to be made about accelerating the process of the engagement and accelerating the implementation of whatever government has agreed. So from the point of view of the industrial relations environment, I think some progress is being made to the extent that the strike has been at least put on hold for the next one month, and to the extent that some progress has been made in the negotiations. We cannot be talking about a stalemated engagement as of now. And this agreement is also far-reaching, but I think uh, the scope can be much wider for instance, I expect a lot more pronouncements around issues of the use of fiscal policy. Uh, they talk about buses and CNG. I like to see a situation where we are not just talking about. Uh, sector to also import more buses. It will create more incentives for the private sector to import and make available the CNG accessories and, and so on and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, okay, uh, comrade no, SLA. Accessories for, uh, for, for CNG Dr. vehicles Dr. and Yusuf. so on. I think the, the, the private sector can do more. Dr. Yusuf, your line is a bit, uh, is a bit uh, on and off. Uh, let me use this it's, opportunity. It's, it's, it's on and off, okay. Uh, uh, let, let me use this opportunity to go to Comrade Sele. Comrade Sele, Labour seems, if one were to just oppose this agreement with previous um, interactions of Labour with the federal government, Labour seems to have uh, to have used uh, uh, used a joker in this instance. Labour seems to have gotten uh, much more of what. Uh, an average observer, historical observer of the Labour government uh, negotiations would have thought Labour would have gotten on, in this kind of instance. Uh, what's your take? What could have led to this level of amenability by the federal government to the demands of Labour? Even increasing from the 25,000 naira that the president had pronounced in his Independence Day speech, to 35, 10,000 naira above what the president had earlier pronounced. What's your response to that, Comrade Sela? I think, I, I think my response to that is quite clear. What Labour had done is just taking advantage of the rules of it. Oh, glory. So, mm. The government was not prepared. You take away, you are carrying out the reforms. You are carrying out a structural reforms that is so deep that you know that it's going to create a lot of hardship for the people. And at the end, you didn't put any structure in place. You didn't put any measures in place. So it gives the labor room to now go into the space and start telling you, oh, this is what we want. And that's why when the president made his speech, the president used the word provisional. 
And the word provisional means that the president knows that that is not sacrosanct. Because the, the, the tripartite need to meet. And by the tripartite, I mean the government, the employers, which government and employers, the employers, which is the OPS, and then the the workers, which is represented by the labor unions. So once this tripartite have a meeting, that is whatever is agreed by this tripartite now becomes what will be totally binding. So whether the government says they're increasing minimum wage from 60,000 to 100,000, we know that won't work if, if labor is going to ask for more. And organized private sector also need to be part of it. I, I, I listen to the NECA DG's response, but I also know that he knows that it will be called in the next move because there's going to be a committee on the wage review that will be set up and NECA will be represented. I think that is the rule. These are it's the grand rules. You can't, uh, you can't come to make such a, uh, such a, a change without the organized private sector being part of it. And I think what Labour is also doing is going through, going through it systematically. I, I listened to some uh, opinion, opinion poll or some people talking about how Labour is being weakened, they threaten a strike, they don't go on strike. And the first thing I'm telling them, Labour won is a pressure group. Yes, stri strike, they have, they have a right to strike, they have a right to protest, but you also need to ask yourself, what was the end result? The end result is you want better wages for, for your members, you want the economic environment to also be good for employers. You know, we have this thing that people don't know in the labor movement is that the employers and the employees, our relationship is symbiotic. We need it. Right. So how do you make sure that everybody is at sync is to ensure that you go ahead, you threaten the strike. And the strike can only happen as... as Dr. Yusuf, uh, the last time they gave 21 days, and when the 21 days were expiring, they gave, they now, now they've given 30 days, which of course continually give you room. Uh, let, let, me quickly chip, let, let me quickly chip this in for your attention, uh, Comrade Sele. At some point, it was like there was a fracture of a sort between the two centers of labor, uh, NLC and TUC. Uh, at some point, it seemed like your, the organization where you have much uh, emotional and uh, historical link with the TUC was sounding quite elitist for some members of the public. And uh, you, you're, you're taking a laugh at it. <laughs> okay, that's good enough. And, and that uh, the NLC was, more, was much more alutaish. How did you, veterans and states persons in the, in the uh, trade union movement, how did you get the two sides to reconcile and eventually uh, uh, do the joint uh, pronouncement when they wanted to, when they gave the final notice of the strike? How did you, elders of the, of the movement, reconcile the, the two sides or centers? Yes initially, yes, initially when it all started, uh, I had several invitations from the media to talk about the division that is going on. And I simply refused having any uh, media interview because I know that is a normal, it's normal because TUC, uh, if I'm to describe it, TUC is more of white color and NSC has a blend of white and blue color. So now we always have a divergent view of how to address a, a, a national strike. The first thing is that TUC would start their thinking from the position of what damage is it going to do to the economy and how do we mitigate that damage? And then both sides will now sit down and compare notes and then they will now come to an agreement. But what you have in the labor movement, which I'm always very happy about, is that we have what I call positive tension. Uh, by positive tension, I mean that we are going to discuss it, we will sit down. Similarly, also happened when I was president and Abdul Wahid Omar was president of the Nigeria Labour Congress. But we always find a way to work around our differences. Because our goal is always that, why are we in the union? The reason why we are in the union is to ensure uh, the protect and defend the welfare of our members. So at the end of the day, everybody is going to key into that goal and then stay put. And once they are able to agree on those fine prints, 
then it's very easy to see them uh, go ahead and do a joint press conference. I wasn't surprised, and I was aware of all the all the going on behind the scenes. And, 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 uh, and you have and to tell us where the hands were. And you have refused to to tell us what the elders of the movement did. Yeah, like I'm you not said. Right there. Uh, I'm not uh, VAT removed uh, for a defined period of time on on AGO. Most uh, companies these days, small, medium enterprises, especially enterprises using heavy duty engines to generate power, in, are inevitably bound to, to buy diesel. So I, I'm sitting there thinking, what could that translate to? to an average manufacturer or an average SME, uh, SME who, who has to run generators to produce uh, goods and services? Yes, uh, uh, that is, uh, is something that uh, we appreciate, it's commendable. But before I respond specifically to that, let me say that in all this conversation around wage review and all of that, the SMEs have not been taken into account. Because for many SMEs, even the owner of the businesses, the owners of the businesses, are struggling to remain afloat. Many of them are running at a loss as we speak. Many of them are struggling to pay even their workers, even the old salaries that they were taking. So as we respond to this situation, we should come up with something that is more systemic. Because if we look at people who are workers or who are wage earners, what percentage of them belong to either TUC or NLC. I'm not sure they're up to 10%. So the larger percentage are still employees of the small businesses. So as we respond to these challenges that we are faced with, we must take their interest into account by deploying things that will make it easy for them, not only to continue to be in business, but to be able to even pay their workers, even the current wages that they are paying them. Because the businesses of many of them are at risk as we speak. Dr. Yusuf. Many of them are suspended operations. Dr. Yusuf. So that, uh, Dr. Yes. Yusuf, many of us who have been in this trade for a while have always known that the Nigerian Minimum Wage Act is actually an elitist, elitist statute. Elitist because many of the companies in the private sector uh, fall out of the specifications of the Minimum Wage Act. You, you, will, you will agree with me that many businesses in the agric agricultural sector are left out because maybe the generals who first, uh, who first promulgated what later uh, uh, metamorphosed into the Minimum Wage Act, the decree, Maybe they knew they were going to retire into agriculture, so they left agricultural enterprises out. Apart from that, even in the manufacturing, you would have to have, say, more than 50 employees. I'm not sure where I am now, but there is a segment or a window that, if you really look at that window, majority of the SMEs in Nigeria today literally swimming in that window. So... The minimum wage itself is not meant for the majority of Nigerian workers. How would you respond to that? Yeah, that's a very valid point. That's a valid point because, uh, just as I said, the SMEs, the informal economy and all of that account for over 80% or more, you know, of, of the total workforce uh, in, in this environment. So whatever policies that is being deployed needs to take that into account because they also have a responsibility to review the wages of their workers they have a responsibility to retain employment 
they have a duty to create jobs and they have a duty in a way to also socially i mean to stabilize the social environment because of their sheer numbers so i think this is important so that we can be coming again from a more systemic perspective to well, this uh, issue uh, uh, let and me, that is why the, the, let the me come back to you of review let me come back to you okay. Let me come back to you with some of the, some of the um, programs as enunciated by this administration that they believe would incentivize uh, SMEs. But let me use this opportunity to quickly let uh, Comrade Esele. Comrade Esele, one tends to want to be a bit, a bit, ah, uh, somewhat sober when in an in an environment like nigeria's in a micro economy that is uh, riddled with hyper inflation you get labor only wanting to ask for pecuniary or monetary relief and one naturally feels that this monetary relief would inevitably galvanize inf the inflationary trend bad enough as it is is there any way labor leaders like yourself indeed the old and the new labor leaders is there any way you people can sit down and try to look at other mechanisms and measures that can make labor and government speak to some other incentives apart from monetary incentives that will naturally uh, worsen the condition of inflation. How would you respond to that, uh, Comrade Sele? Okay, now, if, if you look at the 50 points, the, the, the MOU that has been signed, you can see that there are so many areas that Labour is addressing this. First, Labour is talking about CNG. What, what will CNG do is to ease the cost of transportation. And if you are able to to ease the cost of transportation, everybody benefits at the end of the day. And then you also now have labor also going at that the VAT on diesel be taken out. And with that, that also affects manufacturing. It will also affect the cost of production, which means that you also reduce uh, uh, your, your, your cost, your financial outlay. And then the other aspect that you also look at it is that for you to grow any economy in a very tight economic environment, government spends their way through through a very difficult time. That's where we are right now. So if labor don't have, if workers don't have enough money and workers are not spending money because they don't have money to spend, then what you have is that you're going to have, the economy is going to contract. And so once you have that, you are going to have challenges too. So for your economy to grow, your citizens must have money to spend. So if you look at the 15, the, the MOU that has been signed between labor and the federal government, it also encapsulates all of this to make sure that everybody benefits at the end of the day. Okay, uh, Dr. Yusuf. Dr. Yusuf. Do we still have Dr. Yusuf on? Okay, uh, come ready, sell it. Yes. Okay, Dr. Yusuf. Uh, thank you for still being there. I, I, I asked your colleague a question bordering on how to manage, uh, how to manage this um, hyperinflationary trend, especially when it comes to monetary awards by you know our mon monetary agitations by by labor. Uh, what would be your response to that? Although it stated, it rightly stated that they also, are, they also went in, got into agreement with the government on some other measures that are not quite monetary in nature and that will help uh, rein in the, uh, the galloping inflationary trend. But what would be your response to, to that? Well, my response will be that The key drivers of inflation has never been the wages that people collect or the increases in wages uh, that has been announced. It may have some very marginal effects, 
but it's not a fundamental driver of inflation. Now, I'm sure you listened to the new CBM governor when he was interacting with the Senate. And he referred to the impact of money supply on inflation. And specifically, the impact of the waste and means finances, which at a point got as high as almost 30 trillion naira on money supply and the past three effects on inflation. We still have our guest with us, uh, Dr. Muda Yusuf and Comrade Esele. Dr. Yusuf, sorry for cutting you short. We had a bit of a technical glitch in the studio. Uh, please, uh, I should let you finish the point you were, you were making when, before we went on break. Yes, the point I was making was that uh, we need to look at, uh, at the critical drivers of inflation. Uh, review of wages, you know, may have a very marginal effect. But the bigger drivers are those things that are pushing up our money supply, especially the financing of deficits by governments, especially by the Central Bank of Nigeria. Then we have issues of cost push inflation, like the high energy costs, like the exchange rate depreciation. These are bigger factors that are actually driving inflation. So the argument that this review of wages uh, is going to cause inflation, I think, uh, it's, it's a disproportionate kind of argument. Uh, the impact cannot be that significant. You know, so that is the point I'm making. So labor too should be conscious of also how the government is managing the macroeconomic environment. Because the greatest accelerator of poverty in Nigeria today is inflation. That is what has been eroding the wages of workers and the incomes of the ordinary people. And unfortunately, the wages are not moving enough to be able to catch up with inflation. So as even as if we even get some of these uh, reviews, the inflation is ahead of it. So we should also continue to look at you know the advocacy dimension of labor engagement okay. on the macroeconomic policies of government. How much. do we ensure that we don't have further depreciation in the exchange rate, high cost of energy? Uh, and, and things like that, monetization of deficit, those things impact on the macroeconomic environment, they impact on inflation, and they erode the purchasing power of the citizens. So okay. you expand let, the cost let me go to, let, of let me go to, engagement. Let, let me go to Comrade Selle now. Uh, comrade, from some of the submissions of yeah. Dr. Yusuf, it, it is quite obvious to many, even some of us, on this side of the divide. That is about time labor sat with the organized private sector and have a common strategy to combating the galloping inflation that is now rubbishing the value of money in this society. Uh, labor seems to play the combative element or the combative strategy more, but the thinking cap strategy, the strategic strategy, the strategy of indeed holding joint session with the private sector with a view to coming to a common position to tell government, this we believe, irrespective of whatever may be your policy, this may be helpful. Uh, what, say, what do you say to that? I, I think because the organized private sector and labor are not, not holding a joint press conference the way you see NAC and TUC doing it. That's not going on. There are a lot of back channel conversation between organized private sector and labor. And you know organized private sector, they also like to work on behind the scene. One of the reasons they like working behind the scene is that they also don't want in any way to, 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 to be found, to be competing, or wanting to undermine the government in power. So I'll give, I'll give you an example of even the Petroleum Industry Bill, which is now Petroleum Industrial Act, PIA, 
It was also a collaborative effort between organized, the organized private sector and labor, especially Pengasi New Peng, and there were a series of meetings that were, and the NNPC at the end of the day. So if you also look at the other point of it, of the other point, how many times do you see labor and organized private sector up in arms? They, they, are, they are less than 10% of the time. Most times you always have labor uh, versus government. You don't have labor versus organized private sector because there are internal mechanisms that are used between labor and the organized private sector. And I also let you know that the first quarter of next year, the organized private sector, the current uh, DG of NECA, is also organizing a forum that is between labor and NECA. They, they, they have informal, a lot of informal meetings, but now they are coming out and making it a lot more formal. So in this meeting that they have scheduled to hold first quarter of next year, we're also going to have the president of Nigeria Industrial Court. So all the stakeholders in that, uh, in that space are coming together to also review what is happening. But I'll tell you the relationship between organized private sector and labor has never been this uh, uh, better. So, but there's still rooms for improvement. Uh, yeah. say, let me get a bit cheeky here now. It does seem, yes. uh, maybe for some of us who, who were in the Marxist movement in our, in our college days, uh, yes. it, it does seem that the Aluta wing of labor, the, uh, the theatrical wing of labor, the we no go agree wing of labor uh, seems to always uh, define labor or get more visible than the strategic, thoughtful wing of labor. And so yes. uh, one wonders, is that the only way to be relevant in the labor movement? I'm just asking because you and indeed the, your successor, Oh, no, the incumbent yes. leader of TUC, you seem a yes. bit less, uh, dra uh, less melodramatic in the, Aluta, in the Aluta sense. You portray yourselves to be a bit more thoughtful, strategic thinkers and communicators. Uh, uh, it, it, mo but must, the, must labor leaders be always combative, always uh, Aluta-ish, quote-unquote, if uh, there is any word like that? <laughs> I think it has to do with individual preferences. For example, the current TUC president, just like I, I during my time, is also the current president of Petroleum and Natural Gas in the Association. So he's wearing both caps as president of Pengasin and president of TUC, just like I did when I was uh, also uh, at, the, at the helm of affairs. Then, then what is our background? Our background is that you hardly see issues happening in the oil and gas. The, engagement, we have collected bargaining agreement, and we have trained some of the best schools around. So there is a time for Aluta, which is we know agree. There's nothing wrong with that. There's also a time for us to apply our, our, mental, our mental ability, the intellectual depth that we possess. You know, sometimes I have been somewhere and somebody says, oh, we don't know that labor leaders are this sound. And I say, excuse me, what do you mean? You think we didn't go to school? I, and I was telling somebody earlier on, he was making allusion to the current uh, uh, president of TUC. I said, he's an engineer, for God's sake, and he works for Total Petroleum. And he's not just an engineer, he's a high flyer. You know, these are people, you so, say, these are management projections. So you, I don't want to tell you about the city right now. Okay, so, so you guys are the Rolls Royce of the labor movement, and you, we have the more side of the... Okay, let's, let, let me go to... No, 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 uh, no, no I, don't, I will not agree with you. I never said, I never, I, I never, I never said, said, I never said that. I'm of labor on the more side. No, 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 I never said that, I never said that. You know, I, I, I take it back. I know you won't quite agree to it, but uh, okay. those of us who are watchers, we know what we see. Uh, you, you are laughing. Maybe that's, that's constant of a thought. Um, Dr. Muda, one cannot but look at the Nigerian economy and feel somewhat perplexed. You have been there as the DG of a prominent uh, chamber of commerce, the Lagos Chamber of Commerce. You are in your incumbent position, the, uh, the chief executive officer of an economic, macroeconomic think tank. Dr. Muda, how could somebody like you profile suggestions to the government on how to arrest 
this seeming rudderlessness? Well, uh, first, let me say that uh, it is not a rudderless trajectory. Uh, there is a direction in my view. And what is happening currently is a decision or the desire or the objective to correct some of the distortions of the past. These are essentially corrective reforms. I'm talking about reforms in the oil and gas and reforms in our foreign exchange market. Unfortunately, these reforms have come with some very serious pains. The hardship was much bigger than what many of us expected, unfortunately. And just as I said, the government needed to have responded much faster. But these are things that we need to do to stabilize our environment. Call the sellers in oil and gas. For many years, apart from the upstream sector, we have not had any serious private investment in the downstream, particularly the refineries. And for an oil producing country to be operating for decades, we have been in oil business for close to six decades or more. We don't have functioning private refineries. These are some of the policy missteps that has taken place over the years. And that is part of what has brought us to this situation. Uh, Dr. Muda, uh, one can... Especially in the downstream sector. One can only respect... We have the downstream sector that is populated by bureaucrats and politicians. How do you get results from that? So the reforms is to refocus the sector within the framework of the Petroleum Industry Act. The same thing with the foreign exchange. Unfortunately, we do not have the fundamentals to be able to support the reforms in the foreign exchange market. I'm talking about the capacity of the CBA to stabilize the market by way of the reserves. Because the reserves have been significantly encumbered and that has triggered a lot of speculative activities, which is leading to the, this very sharp slide in the Naira. For me, from a policy perspective, I think we are on course, although we need a, some fine tuning as we progress you know, with the current reforms. And more importantly, the government also needs to come to the realization that the hardship on the ordinary Nigerians are immense, and we need to do a lot more to push in these hardships. Beyond just giving salaries and things, we need to come up with things that have this. What are the fundamental um, measures that some, somebody like you would expect to be on the table at this juncture? Uh, we know that the structural reforms uh, are somewhat inevitable. Many of us, indeed, uh, myself inclusive, I will add that. For years, mouth the fact that the subsidy had to go, it's gone now, but it's looking like we never quite planned well enough before it was removed. What are the uh, suggestions you have? Just in about one minute, because we have, a, we have less than two minutes to go. No, see, the suggestions I have is that now that we have a policy that has opened up this space for the private sector, the government to come with more robust fiscal incentives to encourage more private sector players in that sector. Whether they are domestic private sector players, whether they are private sector, I mean foreign investors, we have to rule out incentives and publicize it well enough. Okay, let, then let... we have to have a good handle on security in oil producing coming in the oil producing areas. We cannot have a space as important as that looking as if it is completely ungoverned. 
Okay, it's not let, let, me, let me quickly go it to... It has been like that for years. Let me quickly go to Comrade Sele to round up. Comrade Sele, uh, you are, in many respects, a leader not only in the organized labor movement anymore, you are indeed. Uh, a, but joining statesman now, because it's been a while that you've left office as TUC and Pendleton president, and you are out there. What would be your suggestions to government at this juncture on how to better engage with, uh, with labor? In about 30 government, seconds. Government should not just talk the walk, government should walk the talk. If they do that, then you will find out that there will be, there will be social cohesion and the dialogue between go government and labor will go smoothly. So it is keeping to your words and keeping to your promises. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Muda Yusuf, Director, CEO Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise, PPE, and Comrade Esele, former President TUC and Pengerson. Thank you so much for enriching this program uh, tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is where Thank you. we wrap it up, and that's it. For today, I am Bola Oba. Have a good night. Thank you.